I can use the fundamental accounting principle to quantify outcomes and calculate compound probabilities. So take a minute and copy that down, please. So the fundamental accounting principle, if an event A can occur, this is pretty nerdy stuff, by the way. Um, so if you're looking at two or more uh, different, well, even one, by the way, but two or more usually uh, uh, different things happening, experiments, right? Like let's say that you're rolling a dice like we saw and flipping a coin. Well, you can figure out how many outcomes are possible, which again is the denominator of the fraction. Uh, again, that, that would be theoretical. Before you begin, okay? And then, of course, figuring out the numerator, we'll, we'll look at ways to do that. But fundamental counting principle is just to find how many ways two or more events can occur, two or more experiments can occur if it happens in succession and we're saying that the two are related. So we can use a tree diagram to uh, identify all of the outcomes. Now this is, this is kind of different from the tree diagram that we saw when we looked at factoring. Uh, these tree diagrams are usually horizontal, right? Like when we saw factoring tree diagrams, it kind of worked its way down like this, something like that, right? But these ones are gonna work themselves sideways. And you'll see this kind of thing like this. In fact, usually the, the way that I do this because well, do all math people do the same thing all the time? No, of course not. So you'll see them kind of split up like this, maybe. And then you get little branches coming out of each of these. And then eventually you'll just get lines that come out. And then this is where we have our outcomes. Okay. So. Getting around your space there, but outcomes. Okay, that's kind of the last. That's kind of the fruit that we see from the tree, right? Well, these are the outcomes. And however many outcomes there are, of course, will tell you the denominator of the fraction when we look at the probabilities. So let's go ahead and make a, uh, a tree diagram with this. Now, it doesn't matter which one you start with. You got bread, meat, and cheese. How is bacon not on there? In any case, yeah, I know, criminal. But in any case, you got bread. <laughs> you can put whatever you want. I'm just gonna stick with this to not make it too complicated. But in any case, bread, and we got meat. And we got cheese. I should have given myself more space here. And we have the outcomes. So bread, what do we got for bread? We got uh, white or wheat. They both start with W. Usually I kind of abbreviate these, but whatever. So I'm gonna actually have to write them all out. So you got white here, and then we'll do wheat here in the bottom. Right there, okay? Now, this is this is as if you were to choose a sandwich randomly, which I don't know why you would do, especially since bacon's not one of the meats, but in any case, all right? From the bread, you have meats, and of those meats, you got three different choices, turkey, ham, or roast beef, okay? So that means that this, this part of the tree is gonna branch out into three different meats. You got ham, you got turkey, and you got roast beef. I'm gonna abbreviate that though, RB for roast beef, because writing's too hard. Okay, and well, what if, you, what if you chose wheat bread? Well, you'd have the same three choices for meat. You could have either ham on the sandwich, you could have turkey on the sandwich, or you could have roast beef on the sandwich. RB for roast beef. But not on this one. So, we have to zoom in on this one and make it kind of small. That I hope that's okay for now. But, for cheeses, you got provolone or cheddar. Oh, provolones. Provolone. Or cheddar. Uh, oh, I did spell cheddar right. Okay. Well... That's if I chose ham, that's what I just put right there. If I chose ham, I could either have provolone or cheddar. Well, it's the same two choices as if I uh, were to choose from turkey, right? So from turkey, you could get provolone or cheddar. What about roast beef? It's the same thing. Okay, so we're gonna take this. Let's see if the technology will let me copy. Oh, there it goes, boom, see that? Could have either provolone or cheddar with roast beef. 
What about, uh, what, if, what if you had chosen wheat bread? Well, you got the same meats, ham, turkey, or roast beef. I almost said ribeye, but uh, it's the same thing on those ones. Okay, so paste, paste, paste. Let's see if we can, it's kind of squished in there. That's all right, I hope. There we go. So from ham, you can choose provolone or cheddar. From turkey, provolone or, I missed that one. There we go. And from roast beef, provolone or cheddar, okay? Let me put this out here. So if if you had reversed meat and cheese, right? I mean, I would always put meat on first, but if you put cheese on first, then you'd have two branches coming out of the bread for provolone and cheese, and then three branches coming out of each of the types of cheeses. I guess that seems to make sense. We did the smaller one last, but either way, yep. But the point here is that if you did switch meat and cheese and even bread with any of the others, I don't know how you'd start a sandwich without, without bread first, but you'd still get the same number of outcomes, which is really what we're looking for here. So this takes us then to our outcomes. It's going to be fun. So right here, we got. let's look at these two first, okay? So what is the outcome that we're looking at from this? Well... It can be hard to write it in here, but it means that you chose you would have chosen white bread first. You would have chosen white bread with ham. And specifically with provolone cheese. Okay, so that's that outcome right there. A white sandwich, a white bread sandwich with ham and provolone cheese. And then the next one. All we're doing, by the way, is we're just following the branch, right? You stay with you see white bread, ham, but now cheddar, right? See how we're following that branch down right there? So now it's still the same type of bread. It's still white bread. Still ham. But now we change the cheese into cheddar. Okay. Now we can see, uh, and I'm not going to list all these right now. I'll just put them on later. But uh, how many total outcomes are there? Is this two? Four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Twelve. How do we get twelve? By using what we would consider the fundamental counting principle. Here is how. Is how many breads do we got? Two. How many meats do we got? Three. How many cheeses do we got? Two. The fundamental counting principle. I don't know if FCP is technical, but here we go, because I don't want to write it all out. You just multiply those. Two times three times two has twelve outcomes. Okay. Um, let's see if I can put this in here. Outcomes. Twelve possible outcomes. And again, if, if you're looking at some kind of theoretical probability, then you could use uh, twelve as your denominator there. All right, we're not actually gonna do the tree on this one. What I really want to do is uh, figure out how many possible outcomes could happen from this, right? So we need to identify what we're looking at. We're looking at uh, school team sells caps in two colors, uh, two sizes and two fabrics. So we got three different categories. We got colors, we got sizes, and we have fabrics. And again, if we use the fundamental counting principle, uh, we can figure out the total number. I'm going to put the total over here. Total number of outcomes. Okay. Well, how many colors are there? It says there's two right there. How many sizes? Two. There's a two there. How many fabrics? Two. Oh, okay. So if I wanted the total, again, just multiply these out, and this would show eight different outcomes. Now, if, if we wanted to know all the specific outcomes, a tree diagram is very useful. But for now, the main thing I really want to do is figure out how many outcomes there are, which will uh, allow us to expedite the process in finding probabilities here in the future. You can buy a burrito made from a flour tortilla or a corn tortilla. You have a choice of three filling, beef, chicken, or beans. Still no bacon, huh? You can also choose medium salsa or hot salsa on top. It looks like you have to choose the salsa. We're not going to worry about the tree diagram. We just want to figure out how many outcomes, right? 
So the first thing we see here is that you have a choice of tortilla. And we'll pretend like I'm saying tortilla correctly. Uh, and then you got fillings as well. And then you also have some kind of salsa you can choose from. Of course, if they said, well, no salsa is also uh, an option, then you'd say, okay, then we can add that in there. But it, it's not an option on this problem. And how many outcomes do we got, right? Number of outcomes. Well, this one's not too bad. How many tortillas have we got? A flour and corn tortilla. That's two different types of cor uh, tortillas. It says you got three fillings of beef, uh, of, of meat, it looks like. Beef, chicken, or beans. Well, beans is not meat, but whatever, three. And then you got two types of salsa, too, right there. So we're just going to multiply these out, and this will tell us how many outcomes there are. Two times three is six, times two is 12. 12 outcomes. Now, I don't know anyone that really goes to a restaurant and is like, I'm going to choose something randomly based on the tortillas, fillings, and salsa. I know there's restaurants you could do that. Uh, and if you're nerdy like me, you'd actually go to one of those restaurants and be like, oh, yeah, we could definitely figure out how many outcomes there are. I don't, I don't, ex I don't, uh, I would not suggest doing that out loud because, you know, people would think you're a nerd, unless that's what you're going for. Uh, but that would, that would be a way to figure out how many possible outcomes. If you were choosing a burrito randomly, right? Well, how many people choose burritos randomly? I have no idea. I'm not one of them, though. Especially if it doesn't have bacon. Julie has finally narrowed her clothing choices for the big party down to three skirts, two tops, and four pairs of shoes. How many different outfits could she, choose, could she form from these choices? Um... And I know it's unfortunate, but some of you guys are like, well, do they match or not? I don't, I don't know, okay? I'm not going to make this more complicated <laughs> than it needs to be. I'm just going to do the math that it tells us to do. Just focus on the math, not the actual... By the way, that should tell you something about schooling. We're telling you not to focus on the actual reality of this, okay? So, but she's narrowed it down. Good job, Julie. So what do we got? She's got skirts. She's got, uh, we're going to say tops here, and then uh, shoes, right? Now, it's not each each shoe, just going to say it's a pair of shoes. Don't, again, don't make this more complicated than it needs to be. And then we got outcomes right here. So, we got three skirts. That's what it says right there. Three skirts. We got two tops and four pairs of shoes. All right, if I want the total, we need, need to multiply. If I wanted to figure out how many possible outfits she can form from this, you know, multiply these together. That's the fundamental counting principle. Three times two is six, times four is 24. So she has 24 different, uh, I'm not going to label this outcomes because this one has a specific label for its uh, outfits instead. Okay. I don't know if that's a lot of outfits. It seems like a lot to me, but whatever. I don't know, and I don't really care either. All right, Utah license plates have three numbers followed by three letters. How many different license plates of this type can be issued in Utah? And I don't know that all, all of them have three numbers and three letters, but here we go, okay? So the first three here are numbers, and then the, the next three are letters. That's important to know. Yeah, followed by three letters. Okay, so that's true. So uh, how many numbers could be used for that first letter? Not at, well, 10 actually, right? I was saying a nine because you can't use zero, but you can use zero, of course. Didn't say that you couldn't. How many for the second one? What, ten. What about the third one? Ten. Now, if 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 by chance it said, hey, you can't use the same number or letter more than once, think about how that would change these values. We're not going to talk about that today, but later on we will. It's coming, all right? Would that be ten factorial? I understand what you're saying, right? Because zeros look like O's. We're going to include all of those letters and numbers, by the way, just because it didn't tell us to not qualify those. So even though, yeah, it's possible that they're not included, I'm going to include them in our calculations. Uh, now, if it, if it didn't, it would need to specify that on this, okay? So how many letters are there in the alphabet? I had to Google it because I was too lazy to actually do my alphabet. I don't think anyone really wants me to see it anyways, but I found yeah, 26. There we go. So there'd be 26 letters to choose from here, 26 right here, and 26 right here. Well, the fundamental counting principle says we're just going to multiply all six of these numbers. Yes, I'm going to need more space. There we go. 
All right, calculator, what do you say? Calculator says one, seven, five, seven, six, one, two, three. So that's 17,576,000. I'll put combinations. Combos on uh, some kind of license plate. And of course, in Utah anyways, there's only what, like three million people, something like that. How many different seven digit telephone numbers can be assigned if the first digit cannot be either one or zero? Try this one out, one minute go. All right, time's up, so let's go ahead and do this one together. It's just that first digit, the first digit here, not one or zero. That only gives us eight different ones to choose from. Uh, of course, the other let numbers here, not letters, numbers. There's 10 different options to choose from. And yeah, I don't know anyone that has uh, zeros all the way through the number, but Wait. we're assuming that this is a possibility right it's here. A, so, a... well, this is pretty easy uh, uh, multiplication. In fact, this is kind of um, scientific notation. Not that anyone wanted to hear that word again, but this is eight times 10 to the power of seven right here. So it really would just be an eight with seven zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So 80 million. Yeah, sorry, I, I forgot that first number is not 10. Good. Well, I'm glad you're paying attention, even though that's not what I was going for, but it works out. So what is that, 8 million then? Okay. Boom. So 80, 80 million, 8 million. I'm not going to put telephone numbers. I'm going to just put numbers. Well, we can put tell numbers. That seems appropriate. You need to make a password that is five numbers long and none of the numbers can repeat. How many passwords can you make? So this one didn't give us the spaces, so I'm just going to form one, two, three, four, five different spaces to use. And it says it's five numbers long, but none of the numbers can repeat. Of course, that means that the first digit you put in, you'd have 10 different options to choose from, but one of them was used, which means the second one would have nine different options. The third one then, two of them have been used, so you got eight left over. Now three have been used, so seven, and then six. Well, this is kind of that factorial thing you guys were talking about earlier, but it doesn't go all the way down to one, so it's still not technically factorial, but uh, there's ways to deal with that, not that we care about in this grade, but I'm going to put this in the calculator, 10 times nine times eight times seven times six. Enter, and it says uh, 30,240. So what is that, passwords? Find each probability for one roll of a dice. Write your answer as a simplified fraction. Oh, okay, that sounds good. So this is rolling a dice. And all of this is theoretical because we're not actually rolling a dice, right? So let's start with the uh, probability of five here, number seven. I think we've seen this one before, but uh, since, since it's theoretical, how many different outcomes can you get with the dice? You get six, so that's our denominator. Five is only one of those options, one-sixth. Number eight, what's the probability of not tossing a one, three, four, or five? Well, still out of six possible outcomes that took up four of them which means it's it this by the way again it's, it's kind of the doing that backwards it's like saying what's the probability of either a two or six this is the same exact probability it's just said in a different way it's just kind of uh, inverted right and of course that's two six that should be simplified into one third if you can always simplify fractions if you can and that all right so the probability seven we're just rolling a six-sided die so i mean there's six different options Seven is none of those options. So this is a zero out of six. I mean, you could just say a 0% chance if you'd like, but again, that'd be changing it into a percent. Yeah, that's a good question. I would keep this fraction as zero over six because it is a theoretical probability. The zero indicates that we can't possibly get a seven. The six indicates that it still would have had um, six possible outcomes from the beginning, as long as, I mean, it hasn't been simplified. Could you, could you change that into equi an equivalent fraction? Yes but the six also specifies how many possible outcomes there were in the beginning. Yeah, again, you make a good point on this. Two six is accurate as long as we want everyone to know how many possible outcomes. And again, this, this goes towards the manipulation of not only probabilities, but statistics is since we can find something equivalent, generally what you're shown when using probabilities and statistics is its simplified form. 
while this one does communicate more, well, um, more appropriate or applicable information, the one-third is its simplif simplified form. So you'll see the one-third, but you are correct, the two-sixths is a little bit more specific to the situation, but be careful on that because I believe the homework does want this simplified into something like one-third. So it depends, right? I mean, are you trying to trick people? Okay, then you know what to do, and you know how to do it. I feel like I'm giving you guys weapons, perhaps, that... Anyways, yeah, use, use them for good. So the probability of two or four, well, uh, it, isn't that what we just kind of saw with there, the two and six right there? It's just a different number there. So it's still six outcomes. Two and four is two of those outcomes. Again, simplify that into one-third. You have a bag of colored cubes. Okay, I got some colors on there. You got 12 reds. You got four blues, kind of yucky. And then five greens. And then three yellows right there. I know it's orange, but it's as yellow as I can make it while it's visible on the screen. So it says, hey, what's the probability of green? Well, that's not too bad. Uh, now, before we figure out these probabilities, actually, let's do one thing, okay? Let's figure out the total number of cubes that are in this bag. So total... We'll calculate this here in the top left. And I got 12 reds and 4 blues. That's 16 total cubes. And then 5. Uh, 12 and 4 is 16. Plus the 5 is 21. And then the 3 yellers right there would give us uh, 24 total cubes. All right, and why do we need that? It's because when we're finding these probabilities... The total is our denominator. And yes, these are still all theoretical probabilities because we're not actually pulling cubes from a hat or bag. So the first one with green, right? Still out of 24. Up there at the top, it says that there are five of these. Now that's our simplified fraction, but it says it also wants it as a, as a percent. So I'm going to change it into a decimal first with the calculator. I get 0 0.283 repeating. Uh, if you need to multiply it by 100 or just move the decimal two times to the right to change it into a percent, feel free to do it. Uh, but that would be our percentage on this one. I'm going to round it to the nearest tenth. That's 20.8%. So what about the probability, number 12, of red or yellow? It's still out of 24, right? Now we have two different colors to add to this one. We got reds. There's 12 reds that it says at the top. And yellows, it says there's three of those. Of course, that would then give us 15 24ths. And that, that's a nice fraction, but it can be simplified. Both those numbers are divisible by 3. So that would simplify then into uh, 5 eighths right there. Uh, and 5 eighths, I mean, using my calculator just to make sure I don't make a mistake, would be 0 0.625, which is 62.5 as a percent. Or the probability of not yellow or red. Now, what we saw from yellow or red was that uh, it was 5 eighths. What I can do is just reverse that. So it's still in eighths, right, if I simplified it. Uh, but how many would be left over would be three of those eight. See how I kind of did that with, with a little bit of reasoning on that? Now, of course, you could have just figured that out. They're just all the blues and greens, which would have been 9 24ths on that, which does simplify into three eighths. So if you need to do it that way, feel free to do it. But if you look at some of the reasoning there with the 5 eighths, you can, you can find that answer pretty quick, as long as you understand that it's the same colors being used, even though they're not listed in the same order. So I do 3 divided by my calculator, and I get 0 0.375, which would be 37.5%. All right, what's the probability of not blue? Still out of 24, but now we're looking at three other colors, right? You got the red, there's 12 red. You got the greens, there's five of those. And you got the yellows, there's three of those. We need to add all these together. So 12 plus 5 is 17, plus 3 is 20, 20 24 This can be simplified. They're both divisible by 4. So that'd be 5 sixths right there. Now when we put 5 six into the calculator, it's going to give us a repeating decimal. That's okay. Just make sure you round, I'm going to round it to the nearest tenth anyways. I got 0 0.83 repeating, so that'd be 
Well, what about the probability of orange? Well, there's 24 of these cubes to choose from. As it turns out, none of them are orange, so that's 0 out of 24. Uh, we'll just say it's a 0% chance. That works. What about the probability of red, blue, or yellow? Well, it's still out of 24, but now we got three colors to choose from. We're just going to add them together. It's 12 reds. There are four blues and three yellows. So let's go and add those together in the numerator. Still out of 24, though. 12 plus 4 is 16, plus 3 is 19. I don't see that this can be simplified, so we're just going to have to keep it the way it is. But I can put in the calculator to change it into a decimal. 0 0.7916 repeating, and that will then convert into 79 point. I'm going to round that right to the nearest tenth. That's a, as a decimal, you're rounding to the nearest thousandth, but 79.2% chance of choosing red, blue, or yellow. So what about the probability of not green? Still 24. So not green or blue would be red or yellow. And there's 12 reds and three yellows. So adding these together. I think we've seen this one already, right? 15 24 fourths. So we know this simplifies into 5 eighths, which we see that was number 12 there, 62.5%. I don't need to plug that into the calculator because I've seen that percentage and a fraction already. So probability of not yellow, still out of 24. Three other colors, right? You got the red, there's 12 of those reds. There are four blues and five greens. What do we get out of this one? 12 and 4 is uh, 16 plus 5 is 21. 21, 24. So I don't think we've seen this. Here's both divisible by 7. That'd be, uh, I'm sorry, they're divisible by 3. 7 eighths. So I'll put that in the calculator. And I get 0 0.875, 87.5%. All right, here's our last one. You have 10 candy bars. Four are Twix. I guess I'll do Twixes in red. Three are Butterfingers, that's purples. Two are Snickers, they're in green, and one is a good old fashioned Milky Way. So you let your friend pick a candy bar, find the probability, they're just randomly picking it out of whatever you got it in. And then we'll write there our answer as a simplified fraction and a percent, just like we did on the last slide. And this is so much fun. So uh, let's, let's first figure out how many total candy bars there are. Total uh, candy bars. So you got four Twix. You got three Butterfingers, two Snickers, one Milky. We just need to add these together. Uh, four, seven, ten. Oh, that's that's gonna make our percentages pretty easy. Ten total bars on this one. So for Snickers, starting out. Yeah, that's why you should pay attention. Unlike I just yeah, sit right there and stop at ten candy bars. My bad. But I felt I feel good about the math I did because that means I got the same answer, or should I say that they got the same answer as me? Any case, ten candy bars. On this one, we're looking specifically at Snickers, and there are two Snickers there in green. Of course, this can be simplified as uh, one fifth. The two tenths, though, that should be pretty easy to, to convert into a decimal or a percent, twenty percent. You can use a calculator to do it if you need to. What about the probability of not Milky Way? So it's still out of 10 candy bars, but not Milky Ways. There's the four Twixes. There's the three Butterfingers. And then two Snickers. So we're just going to add those together. So this would give us uh, 4 plus 3 is 7 plus 2 is 9. 9 tenths. Of course, that would just be 90% right there. 0. 0.9. Changes to 90%. There we go. What about the probability of Twix? It's still 10 candy bars, but there was uh, four Twixes. That we did that one red. Four tenths. Remember, we want the simplified fraction if you can, so that'd be two fifths right there. Four tenths, so you can make it 40 one hundredths, which would be 40%. What about 21? Uh, Twix were Milky Way, and yeah, we'll see if it's the same as 24, but it is. And it's out of 10. And uh, let's see, there's Twixes, four Twixes. And one Milky Way. Let's go and add those together. That'd be five tenths. So he has a, looks like that'd be one half, right? Or 50%. So if if you're looking at Twixes or Milky Way, your friend has a random chance 
50% chance of choosing either one of those. 22, not a Butterfinger, still 10 candy bars. Uh, but not Butterfingers would be Twixes, there's four of those. It'd be Snickers, there's two of those. And then Milky Ways, one of those. So we're just going to add those together. That's going to be uh, four, five, six, seven, seven tenths. That can't be simplified, but we can change it to a percent. Seventy percent. So your friend has a seventy percent chance of not choosing a Butterfinger. How about a Butterfinger, Snickers, or Milky Way? Well, there's ten Butterfingers. You got uh, three of those. Snickers is two of those. And Milky Ways is one, so let's add these together. You get six tenths. That can be simplified, both divisible by two. That's three fifths, or sixty percent. Now, yeah, so twenty-four and twenty-one, they're the same, but it's reversed, right? Don't let that confuse you. Although sometimes in mathematics we reverse things to confuse people and control their brains. So Milky Ways still is one, and Twixes is still four, right? And when you add these together, it still ends up being five tenths, which simplifies into one half, or 50%, okay? So yeah, the order does not matter, except to your brain, somehow maybe convincing yourself that it does matter. Just be careful on that. Probability of not Twix or Butterfinger still out of 10. So not Twixes would be Snickers, and we got two of those, and also Milky Ways is one of those. Adding that together, we get 3 tenths. That cannot be simplified other than change it into a percent, but it's not necessarily simplified as 30% uh, right there. All right, there's our objective. I can use the fundamental counting principle to quantify outcomes and calculate compound uh, probabilities. Now, we didn't see calculating any compound prob probabilities. We definitely will next time, though. We also looked at using the fundamental counting principle in finding how many total outcomes there are. It says quantify outcomes, just total number of outcomes there are for different situations.